Okay, everybody can see that. So alhamdulillah. All right. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so the Prophet's love for diversity and inclusion, Salah Salam. So this is what we're going to talk about this evening. And this is a presentation by the Association of Muslim Chaplains and the kind and generous support of the Community Impact Fund. This is what we're going to be doing. So let me tell you a little bit about our program. We're going to do a welcome and thank you all for being here. And we wanted you to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Then we're going to tell you a little bit about who we are and why we're doing this. And then we're going to spend some time talking about our beloved prophet's love, Salaway Salam, and understanding the origins of racism. And then we're going to have a closing discussion, and then we'll take some Q and A. How does that sound? Sounds like a good even, good little bit of chance. It's good use of your time and energy this evening. Hopefully, it'll be a good use of your time. So, with that. We're gonna ask you to tell, you, tell us a little bit about yourself. So Amber is going to put a link in the chat that is a Google form that we want you to spend a few minutes filling out. So Amber, if you could just put that link in the chat. There it is. So take a minute, about two minutes, and just complete that form so we can just kind of get a sense of who you are, what you think about yourself, how you identify. So just, it just gives us a chance to have an understanding of who our audience is. So just take a few minutes. We'll just give you about two minutes to complete that form. It's not long. We're not asking for blood. We're just asking for a little information and then we'll get started. So Amber, if you can just let us know when two minutes is up. I got you, inshallah. All right. So it's been roughly two minutes. Okay. So thank you all very much. Telling us a little bit of information about yourselves. Now we're gonna get going. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. As Osama said, I am Dr. Nisa Muhammad. I am the president of the Association of Muslim Chaplains. And in my other life, I am the assistant dean of religious life at the Howard University. Now you may have heard of us for this campus, this, University in Washington, DC. And that is where I spent a lot of my time working with the student population there. My, the majority of my time is working with the Muslim population there. And these are students that are undergraduates, graduate students, students that are in the professional schools, but I also work with students of other faiths as well. I work with the Hindu students. I work with the Jewish students. We have a very small population of Jewish students, but we also have um, Christian students. We have a few Buddhists 
Jewish students. So as assistant dean of religious life, I work with all the students of uh, religions, but also the students who I call the wanderers, you know, wandering through life, so to speak, on a journey, trying to find a religion, trying to find a, a um, faith tradition, and also the wanderers, my wanderers and my wanderers, you know, students who are wondering about life, students who may be born to parents of two different faiths, like I have a student who is, it was born to a father who is Muslim, who a mother is Jewish. So she sees herself as religiously Muslim, but culturally Jewish because her mother reared her as in a Jewish cultural household, but her father reared her religiously as Muslim. So imagine that. So, you know, she has, she sees herself as having, you know, the best of, both worlds. So this is the student population that I work with at Howard University. So here we are. What has happened to us in the world around us? What has happened? What has happened in the world of Islam to bring us where we are today in September of 2021? Why do Black Muslims feel so alienated and oppressed by other Muslims? Just in case you didn't know, Black Muslims do feel alienated and oppressed by other Muslims. I hope that's not breaking news for you, but just in case it is, they do, we do. And what can we do about this? A lot of this came to breaking news after the incident with George Floyd. And when black people started saying in louder voices, black lives matter, that really empowered black Muslims to begin to say, you know what? We can shout this too. Black Muslim lives matter as well. And so we begin to say, you know what? We have to begin to speak up for other Black Muslims who don't feel empowered enough to say, you know what? Our lives matter too. And so that's when the Association of Muslim Chaplains who work with Muslims all over in a variety of different spaces from universities to hospitals, to prisons, to third spaces like this, to the military, and we kept hearing from the populations that we serve that Black Muslims are feeling alienated and oppressed, that this is an opportunity for us to begin to serve this population and to serve them in a manner that can help empower them and to help do something about this alienation and oppression to begin to say, wait a minute, that's not Islam. That's not our way. That's not our prophet's way. And that we can begin to show people that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had a great love for diversity and inclusion, that all around him, there were people that looked different from the way he looked and he loved them also. So that's why we're here today to try to share some of what we know about this and to help other people understand what's going on. So here we go. Okay, let's get, so we're gonna see this little film. Yes, I am Black and Muslim, Muslim and Black, rock my hijabs and head wraps, bow my head when I pray, say I mean and I say. My identity is not always received in the best way. Like when I say salam to those of a different race, the look on their face says my skin invalidates my faith. What a shame. When they call on his names, do they also utter Abid for people like me? Are their minds so distorted by white supremacy that they can't see my humanity? Being Black and Muslim is having to explain your very existence from day to day. It's having to say you didn't convert, you were born this way. You feel obligated to teach, but people don't read the holy text only knowing a few hadiths, but still they have the nerve to be the haram police, never to practice what they preach. When you're black and Muslim, it's a constant fight for the spotlight, a struggle to coexist. In Juma prayers, for instance, open hands for the oppressed worldwide, closed mouths for blacks brutalized. I've been called fire. I stayed down the other night. I've been called 
Does our empathy lie in a box in between color lines for a chosen few? Did Allah not make us all equal? Can we cry for Trayvon Martin and Gaza, Michael Brown and Chapel Hill? When you're black and Muslim, you feel conflicted. You know a prophet is falsely depicted. Blonde hair and blue eyes not in the description, but your loved ones hold on to what's been given. So truth is buried and the power is hidden. When you're black and Muslim, being unapologetic is a survival tactic. You are connected. More science and the NOI are to be respected. Movements that help raise a people so their way of life could be corrected, guided to become more than they ever expected. Yes, I am black and Muslim, Muslim and black, rock my hijabs and head wraps, bow my head when I pray, say Amin and Ashe. I've learned to embrace both parts of me. They now coexist in perfect harmony. Black and Muslim, two identities which perfectly complement me. Okay. So, what did you think about that poem? Any comments? Uh, I loved it. I, I loved her honesty um, and her directness. And, and it's probably something that non-Black Muslims need to hear every day. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for that. Anyone else? I think I see myself in that poem on the recipient end of the message being talked about, because I think I see myself in, uh, just in, in those spaces, you know, oftentimes contributing to the marginalization without even thinking about it, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, not lifting up certain narratives there, but uh, it was just a really powerful um, delivery, just, you know, so vivid an image because I can see myself just sitting throughout there. So uh, it, it was really, it was really powerful. And it's really, I think, caused uh, a lot of introspection. Um, and I, I've seen, I've looked at the title and it's in my YouTube now. So I'm going to be looking, watching it a couple of times over. So thank y'all for sharing that. Wonderful, wonderful. And that's what we want people to do tonight. We want you to think. We want you to think, we want you to reflect because this is an opportunity that we're giving us together to look at this faith that we say we love, to look at our prophet Selim as the example so that we can begin to bridge the gaps that are growing wider and wider between us. Because as you say, Muslim space where you belong and we want everybody to belong because we know that's what he was called to do. He was called to give a message for all of mankind and for all to belong. And so, so that takes us to this verse. Oh, mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. And so for black Muslims, we really take this verse to heart. And we really believe that when Allah gave this verse and when Allah revealed this verse, that this verse includes us that Allah meant for us to know each other, that this means for us to know other Muslims, to know other people, to know other countries, other people from other places, and that this is real, that we really believe it. But when we go other places, we go to other masjids, we meet closed doors, we meet closed faces, and we meet people who are like, stop, no, 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 no. It, this is not for you. This doesn't mean literally, it doesn't mean literally. It may mean figuratively, but certainly not literally. That verse cannot mean that. And so we question, does this verse mean the same to all Muslims? And so this was an article that I saw recently where Tahira Na'il Adin was looking for a husband and she asked all around her local community, but Again and again, she was told that eligible Muslim men she encountered were only looking for a Muslim wife from their own ethnic background. They weren't looking for somebody to know from different tribes and families, no. That the spouse had to be Egyptian. They were only looking for a Palestinian wife. Now, she just happened to be, of course, she was Afro-Latina. You know, she was a lawyer, but 
she she could not even be offered as a potential spouse because she was not from a particular tribe or particular ethnic group. And so as a black woman, again, she just didn't seem to qualify. And so again, she herself wondered, did that verse mean the same for all Muslims as it did to her as a black Muslim? Just what does that verse mean? And so we know from our teachings that Iblis was the original racist, that he was made to believe and he thought of himself as that I was made better. And that Iblis thinking I was made better too often has permeated into our masjids around the country where too often other Muslims think that they have been made better than other Muslims because of their skin color, because of the fairness of their skin color, because of their geographic location around the world, because of their ability to speak a certain tongue, because of their knowledge of the faith, that they in fact have been made better. And that is that thinking is the thinking of Iblis. That when in fact we think we are better than one another because of something other than righteous deeds and piety, then we are taking on the thinking of Iblis. Because he is the original one who said, I was made better. And so we know that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his life was full of diversity. Let's start right there. From Um Amen his second mother who was a black woman, his second mother after his mother died from Um Ayman to Usama bin Zaid, his teenage general, to Abu Dar, his companion, a man of moral courage, that man or a man of moral courage, the prophet peace be upon him was surrounded by diversity, surrounded. He was surrounded by diversity. Equity, the Quran says the believing men and the believing women, the fasting men and the fasting women. And inclusion, when the prophet peace be upon him needed advice, he consulted his wives. He didn't just say, I'm just gonna talk to the brothers about this. No, he consulted his wives also. He consulted his companions. He was inclusive of those people around him and he chose Bilal to give the Adan. Bilal was a former slave. He was a former nobody, a former castaway. But when it came time to do the very important job of calling people to prayer, calling people to worship, the prophet, peace be upon him, gave that mighty important job to Bilal, a former nobody. He lifted him up, he empowered him. And today, thousands of years, 1400 years later, hundreds and hundreds of years later, people still call his name. People are still talking about the Muezzin Bilal because Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, chose him for that job. That's how important he is in history. But he's not the only black man. There are other companions that were black that were around the prophet, peace be upon him. But look at our masjids. We go to how many other people of color are there that are surrounding the imam, that are surrounding the people in leadership, that are even in leadership. Does our leadership circle reflect the same leadership circles like Prophet Muhammad's leadership circle? Are we emulating his choices? Are we doing the same kinds of things that he did? Are we following his prophetic example? And so we know our values are faith, good deeds, we live in peace and we give to others, but are these faith, these values just for a select group of people or are these values that we extend to all? Are these values that we extend to all? So black Muslims understand these values and they understand that these values are not just for Muslims, but black Muslims have a dual identity that they are black 
and they are Muslims. And they understand that black people want the same values as well. And so, but black Muslims really get frustrated when they see Muslims just doing things that they think are just good for Muslims, but are not good for the whole of humanity. For example, at the University of Michigan, they were raising money to send water to Pakistan. That is a very noble effort. It is a very noble, wonderful effort to raise money to send water to Pakistan. But does anybody see anything wrong with that? University of Michigan in Detroit raising money, this was a few years ago, to send water to Pakistan. Anybody see anything wrong with that? You could put it in the chat or you could. Yeah, un- Shabia got it. She guessed it. She said Flint. Thank you. Flint, Michigan, 30 minutes right down the road. And so the Black Muslims on the campus were outdone. They were like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Flint, Michigan was in the middle of a major water crisis where the people there had to go and get water for everything. They had to go and get water to bathe. They had to go and get water to cook. They had to go and get water to wash their clothes. They had to go and get water to do everything that you need water for. The people had to leave their homes every day to get water. They're in the middle of a major water crisis. Their children were getting sick. Their children were getting lead poisoning from the water that they were drinking. And there was no one coming to help. How do I know this? Because Howard University, I took a busload, two busloads of students from Howard University to Flint, Michigan. And we and what was on our bus? Cases and cases of water. And who helped us with this? Islamic Relief. We took cases and cases of water to Flint, Michigan and passed them out to families who had to leave their home every day. And I took Muslim students with me because we understand faith, good deeds, live in peace, give to others, not just give to the Muslims, no. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with a message, a final message to all of mankind. I don't care who you are, you're in the middle of a water crisis. I don't care who, Muslim, non-Muslim, Buddhist, Chinese, I don't care. We we serve humanity. And as Muslims, we should we should be the ones to serve it best. We should be the ones to serve it best because we have the final messenger peace upon and we have the best message. So we should be the ones serving it better than anybody else. But sometimes we just Miss, we, we, there's a disconnect. And that is why we are doing this program to help us reconnect with what, what is really, really important. Faith, good deeds, living in peace, giving to others. So those are some of the problems. What can we do? Smile, it is charity. Meet someone new. Someone coming to your space where you belong, make them feel like they belong. I mean, really make them feel like they belong. And it can start with your smile. Connect, introduce yourself and your family. Introduce new people to the imam. Let them know this is our our fabulous imam, or this is our speaker. This is a person who gave the, the, the Juma. This is our khatib. It, connect with people. Let them feel like they are welcome in your space. Don't let new people just come and go and they don't meet anybody. They don't know anybody. Invite them to other programs. Well, you know what, brother? We had this program tonight. Come back tomorrow because we're having such and such a program. Or next week, we're going to have this program. Invite them to other programs. Exchange contact information. Start a real brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, we know when the people, when the Muslims left Mecca and made Hijra, a lot of them left everything for God. They faced religious persecution and 
when it was time to go, they left like everything. I mean, just can you imagine leaving everything? Some people left families, they left their homes, they left their jewels, they left everything for God, for God, because they heard a word that spoke to their heart. They heard a message. They heard they, they met a messenger of God. And it changed their lives. They didn't want to worship idols anymore. They didn't want to bury their girls, their girl babies anymore. They, 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 they didn't want to fornicate anymore. They didn't want to live that life anymore. They wanted to change their lives and be better people. And so they left everything they had and said, I'm done with that life. I'm done with this. I am out of here. And they went to Yathrib then became Medina and they had nothing. A lot of them didn't know anybody because they had left everything for God. And Prophet Muhammad told them he knew they were lonely. They didn't have jobs, they didn't have anything. And so what did he do? He paired them with a new brother and a new sister. He made for them new families. That is an example. Create a real brotherhood and a sisterhood with the new people in your center. Help them meet somebody. Help them create a real and a new sisterhood and brotherhood because people come and they don't know anybody and they are looking to meet people. We are social beings and we come to places and all we hear is you can't do this, you can't do that, don't do this, don't go there, don't do that, Islam. And people are like, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. I don't know anybody and all I'm hearing is I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, I can't even make a friend. I don't even know anybody. And I'm not gonna know anybody because nobody is here. Nobody here looks like me and nobody wants to meet me. Make where you belong real. If that's your slogan, where you belong, make it real. Make people feel like this is where I belong. Make it, make it like, you know, when I came to their program, they really made me feel like I belong. They made me feel like I was an old friend. They made me, I, I met so many people like, oh my God. And they called me the next week. And somebody asked me to come back to another program. And Somebody called me the next week and asked, somebody asked me how I was doing. And, you know, somebody said, what do I do? And somebody asked me if I had any skills and somebody asked me if I wanted to be involved. And I mean, they really made me feel like I belonged. That's how we make people feel like they belong. Because for real, for real, I don't know if y'all say that in your, where you are, but in DC, people say that for real, for real. You know, people want to belong. People come to Islam because they have tried other faiths and it didn't work. I mean, for some people who have been born and born, they're born Muslims, but I'm a convert. And I know people who convert and they come to Islam because they've tried other stuff and they have sinned and they have suffered and they're ashamed. And so they want to come to a place where nobody cares. Nobody cares about your sins. Nobody cares that you've suffered. Nobody cares that you're ashamed. All they care about is who you are today. They care that who you are that Allah has blessed you to be this day. And we are so thankful that every day Allah gives us another opportunity to be somebody brand new. And sometimes, you know, young people, so you're trying to be brand new. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I'm trying to be brand new. Not your kind of brand new. I'm trying to be Allah's brand new. I am really trying to be brand new. Every day Allah gives me the opportunity to be brand new. I'm, I'm taking it because we all want to be brand new for Allah. And so people want to be brand new and they want to be in a place where they are encouraged to be brand new. They're encouraged to be better and new and wonderful and exciting and joyous and to be around people who are just like that. And I know at your place where it says, be well, we, you know, be, we want to welcome you, that this is the right place. So let it be a right place, not just for the Pakistanis or the South Asians or the Arabs. Let it be a welcoming place for everyone because that's what they want. And so 
there is a new book out called The Spirit of Black Folks. And in this book, it says, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, emulate black people for there are three among them who are leaders of the inhabitants of paradise, Lukman the wise, the Negus, the Bal and Bilal the Muezzin. And this is an amazing book that is put out by Celebrate Mercy. And order this book if you can. It's all about black people around the messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's called Sages Through the Ages, The Excellence of Black People. Now imagine this, we gotta put out a book called The Excellence of Black People. It's very sad that this kind of book has to be, has to be done, but it's very amazing because it is, about, it is about the excellence of black people. And so it's because we just don't think that any, there's any excellence about black people. It's very sad. But there's so many amazing things about Black people in Islam. We just don't know it. But it's our time. Black Muslim lives matter. Yay. So from Prophet Muhammad's last sermon, peace be and blessings be upon him, he gives this amazing portion of that sermon where he talks about the equity and equality of all people. And I'm sure all of you have heard this so many times, so I won't repeat this. You can read this, but this is so amazing. He talks about the equity and equality of all people. And, you know, we're all in this together. We're all in this together, believe it or not. We are all in this together. And so the Quran is our best book of guidance and Prophet Muhammad's life peace be upon him, is the best example of how to implement it. So I just encourage all of us to let's work harder to show everyone his love for diversity and inclusion, not what we think of how it should be and how somebody else showed us and somebody else told us how it should be. Let's emulate his prophetic example for diversity and inclusion because his way is Allah's way because even when he tried to do something different, when he was trying to appeal to the upper classes, Allah chastised him because the blind man was just tapping right there by him. And he kind of ignored the blind man, but Allah said, oh, no, 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 no. You will not ignore my people. Do not ignore Allah's people. Do not ignore the people who really need to be seen. Do not do that. And so, Jazakallah, thank you all so much for listening. Do you have any questions, any comments, anything you want to add? I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. No? Any questions? Hey, Salam Alaikum. Thank you so much, Hello. guys. Um, that, was, that was awesome. Um, and uh, as much as we like to boast that we are inclusive, um, I know that we are we fall short at times. And so I really appreciate um, some of the things that you had mentioned. You know, make sure you check up on people. Like if someone's if someone's come in that's new, we're we're really good at greeting them. But did we check in with them a few days later? Right. Um, so not so much a question, but um, you know, at the same time, you are sort of preaching to the choir. You know, you've come to Muslim space where we, this is, this is our kind of our bread and butter. This, this is our intent is, is to develop a community that is prophetic in how it is inclusive. Um, but how do you, how do you get through to sort of the mainstream massage that are uh, extremely cultural um, where they, um, like you said, the, the, the leadership board is relatively monolithic um, it's, it, you just don't, you know, you don't see that. I know we have our own issues in Austin where we like to boast that Islam erased racism. <laughs> and when you ask for where, why do the, why do the black Muslims pray in a church on, the, you know, like on the East side, you get a lot of like stunned faces. Um, but, but how, how do you, what is the best way aside from presenting this talk, what is the best way to, to sort of get this message across to maybe the communities that need it most? So that's why we're doing this to really try to help them see this because um, Black Muslims are suffering in a lot of places. Like you said, Black Muslims are praying in a church, you know, because they're, they're not being heard. And other people, 
don't seem to get it. And that's really the reason why we are doing this kind of, these kind of like one hour talks just to kind of get the message across in a kind of non-threatening way to help them see and feel and understand that this is not something that we're making up. This is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon This is his way. This is, we're not, this is his way. We're not originated, originators of this. We're just asking you to do what he did. We're calling you back to his way, not your, because what you're doing now is you're doing your thing. We're calling you back to his way. And so that's all we're asking you to do. Stop doing your own thing and do his thing. And I think if we, if we prepare the message like that, that helps people to see the difference in what they're doing compared to what he did. Well, you guys have put together something truly beautiful. And so inshallah, um, this talk gets spread around a lot more. Um, and, and it lands on the ears of the folks that need to hear it the most. And I'm not saying we're immune. We do need to hear this. We need to hear it often. So thank you so much. Um, but inshallah, this continues to spread. Maybe, maybe it is our job as non-Black Muslims to be that voice, to be that advocate. You know, you guys, yeah, the burden exactly. should be, you know. And, that and exactly. And so this is like, this is our trial period. You're one of, I don't want to call you our, like, our, you're our test case. We're our guinea pig. That's okay. We like being I don't want to say guinea pig. I don't want to call you <laughs> that. So this is like our little trial period to see how this is. So we are refining our presentation. And so, you know, we want to just, you know, that's, that's why we're doing our little pre and post surveys to just kind of see, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what you like, what you didn't like, because we want to want to know what is working with this presentation, because we do want to take it to other, you know, places to really get this message across, because what we are hearing from other black Muslims around the country that they're suffering. And it's not even just, a, it's children, you know, children in uh, in schools. You know, I mentioned the issue at um, University of, of Michigan, MSA. You know, black Muslims are leaving the MSAs all around the country because of these exact same reasons. You know, um, going to, uh, so I was at um, another university and I was talking to the, the MSA because the black Muslims were threatening to leave the MSA. And I asked the students, I said, hey, do you ever have a black imam come and do Juma? And they're like, no. I said, like, you have all these black Muslims here on campus and you never have a black imam come and do Juma? Well, no, we never really thought about that. Well, then why do you think the black Muslims would be ever be satisfied with what's going on? And you never have anyone come that looks like them to do Juma. Do you ever have anybody black come and give a lecture, do a program, anything like that? No. Well, what do you think the subtle message is that you are giving to them? That, that, there's, that only Arabs and South Asians can teach Islam. And so the black Muslims left. The MSA started their own black Muslim organization. Now, now in the in the MSA, in originally there were only like maybe 10 or 15 black Muslims who came out. But when the black Muslims left and started their own organizations, there were about 50 black Muslims on the campus because they, the other ones they just didn't want to be bothered with all the other things. The black Muslims found out that when they would come to events the other Muslims would start speaking in a foreign language. I and mean, it was just that bad, right? They would come to the event and the other two would speak in a different language. I mean, it was just that blatant. It was, I mean, they were just telling me all of these like horror stories and then, and, and they had a Muslim chaplain. They had, a, the thing was they had a Muslim chaplain and the Muslim chaplain tried to navigate, you know, what was going on to no avail, to just to no avail. I mean, so these, these things and they're, they're, this, this stuff runs very, very deep. And what happens is that then these Muslims graduate from college and then go to the masjid and then just, it just continues. And so that's why we're doing these at masjids and we're also doing them on college campuses to also try to, you know, stop, you know, some of what's happening on college campuses because it's very, very painful for students. 
you know, when you started off by saying, I, I don't mean to. Um, no, it's okay. But, but, but when you said in the beginning that um, the Black Muslims are suffering, um, I don't think we've heard it like that before. And so I really appreciate that because I think it, it gives it, um, um, uh, puts it in a much more serious category than non-Black Muslims really understand. So to come right out and say that right from the get-go, that sort of set the tone, like, I'm going to pay attention because you can't continue living as normal, operating as normal when you are made aware that there are brothers and sisters who are literally suffering. So thank you for saying that right from the beginning. I, I think that was very important to do. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now, but thank you. Any other questions, comments? Not really a question, but Jazakallah for your presentation. It was very beautiful. I fully agree with everything that you said and with the message you gave to us at Muslim Space as well. And sometimes when we have, when we used to have in-person events and everybody was decorating the tables and you know making things look beautiful, I would always go around fussing and saying, you know, it's good to make things look beautiful, but the real beauty is in our ikhlaq. It's how we talk to people, how we welcome them. People won't remember what the flowers on the table look like. They won't remember what the name tags look like, but they will remember how they were treated. And so I think that is a resonating theme. And recently I have two kids in college. So my son went to the masjid and he thought the prayer had ended. It was starting, there was some confusion and he did something wrong. And after the prayer was over, a brother took him aside and he said, explain in the most beautiful and the kindest manner what his mistake was. And you know, you, if, if you come in and people are praying, just join them there, don't worry about anything else. And, and he's going to the masjid, he's happy there. So the smallest thing can make such a big difference in someone's life. I think we don't realize the value of that. I think people who have been marginalized or who have been on the other side understand it better. People who haven't may not even get it. And so thank you so much for your message. Now that's it's a very, very, very good lesson. The smallest things, and it's on the opposite also, the smallest things can be so painful. So I have students um, who are constantly asked, are you a convert? Are you a convert? They clearly look African. You know, my students said, I, my family has been Muslim for over a thousand years. And I'm asked, am I a convert? She's like, why? And it's a microaggression. You know, it's just, it's just a microaggression to just ask me, are you a convert? Just or a micro stupidity. Sometimes yeah, I call right. it that. It's a, right. the micro stupid. Why don't we think before we talk? It wouldn't hurt us at all to, to just to think a little bit more. And I think Masajid should talk about these messages that people are given, these specific things. When we're here, we all belong. It doesn't matter. If you've been Muslim for millions of years or you just started, why should it matter? Why should you be asked? Why should it be commented upon? Exactly. It's an undressing. I mean, you know, it's, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So anything else? Any other comments, questions? If not, okay. Amber has a, our final little survey. She's gonna put that in the chat. If you could just take a minute and answer these final little questions. You're right. It feels very invalidating. Are you a convert? Like, like what? Like what? Who cares? Oh, yep. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank you again for that wonderful presentation. And I think it's, I just wanted to piggyback and say I loved everyone's comments. And I was just like remembering all these things, but I was just like, oh, wow, this is why it's so important to have so many different voices and a diverse group of people represented in, in these uh, tables and get togethers. I think that's why it's so much more important. And I think that's the best way we can do it. So I just wanna thank you again, Dr. Nissa and everyone here. No, well, thank you. And thank you to Osama. I mean, Osama is, Osama is the man, Osama is amazing. Let me just tell you that Osama is amazing. I met Osama almost a year ago 
when we were working on our conference and he, Usama just stepped in, he just made everything possible. So Usama is amazing and you are so blessed to have him there. And so I know whatever you all are doing there, Usama has put a stamp of approval on it and Usama is just making it live and wonderful. So. This is my favorite, favorite part of the session. I, 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 I like it. <laughs> yes, the accolades, the accolades, the accolades. So, well, thank you all again so much. I hope you all have enjoyed it. You have learned something. I really appreciate it. And Osama, I will see you soon. I am sure, inshallah. Inshallah. I got one quick question sure. for you all in the survey. So uh, uh, we had um, uh, just the other registrants who weren't able to come. Um, I'm going to be just emailing them the link uh, for the video to watch. Is it okay if I send them that post survey as well? Sure. That Feedback. Cool. That is absolutely fine. Thank you all so much. You can give them the pre and the post. That's fine. Both links are fine. Awesome. Thank you all again. Uh, this was really okay. great. Look forward to doing some more stuff with y'all. Inshallah. Thank you all so much. Take all care. Right. Awesome. Awesome.